Nehemiah, Ezra and Nehemiah, this, uh, this partnership that took place many, many centuries ago has been our focus now for a number of weeks, probably eight, nine, ten weeks. Uh, we've been moving across uh, portions of this particular uh, part of God's Word uh, and, and I, I have en endeavoured to uh, engage it as much as I can and uh, allow that word to, to speak into my life. And then some of what the Lord shows me, I share with you on Sunday, not as a person who's got the whole picture together, but simply the things that the Lord's making clear to me. But it's a wonderful thing that we're able to take these small portions of God's word and know that they will continue to speak powerfully into our lives. And particularly this one, because it is a portion of God's word that speaks to us as a community. As a community of people who just like those people in the time of Nehemiah, we are people who have a calling on our lives. A calling to be a people holy and set apart. Exactly the same terms that were used in the Old Testament. We are called to be a people who have a defined nature. We are people called to be distinct in, in the values and priorities and purpose and direction of our lives. We are people just like the time of Nehemiah, that we are, have this wonderful way in which we can still be diverse and yet be totally united in this oneness of our relationship with God. In the context of Nehemiah, the contract that they had there, the covenant they had, was with the living God, the one true living God. And so is ours. The difference being that we have this personal presentation of the identity of his son that we've just been spoken of by Rob. That, that favoured passage that speaks so powerfully of now we have a person that we relate to. Not a, not a script scribed on stone, but a person. The covenant relationship that the people of God had in the time of Nehemiah, as had happened for many generations before, where there were times when that relationship was at its absolute peak. And they were celebrating and they had done, entered into every provision the Lord had made and the, and the boundaries of the promised land were clearly defined and there was a great season in the grace of God. But those seasons, sadly, were quite short. Most of the time, these were a people stiff-necked. They were a people who were wayward. They were people unresponsive and rebellious, consistently stepping away from their part of the agreement. And as a result, the history that we read through, particularly the Old Testament, you may, many of you are familiar with it. There is this, this God of grace who is searching them out, confronting them, enabling some sort of passageway for them to come back into a relationship with him. So by the time our history's path connects with the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, the people of God are once again at that place of being fragmented, of being, as it were, as a result of their stepping out of line, as it were, and going off into the jungles of the world around, they, they were in the risk. There was a risk of actually the nation of God's people perishing altogether. They were, they were that, that was the situation. And even as we find, as it were, Nehemiah stepping into the picture, we realise that risk is still there, despite the powerful leadership that he brings. We have read a, po a portion of history that covers probably 80 years. And I know I've mentioned it a couple of times. When it comes to being the people of God, sometimes the whole rebuild, restoring bit is not just a matter of six months, she'll be right, mate. Or 12 months, if you really put your back into it. The season of restoring is something that's got a measure of time that only God can determine. But certainly the responsiveness of the people will accelerate that process. 
And so there's this beautiful, what I consider is this really good arrangement where God sets the course and the timeline and he invites every person in each generation to say, I'm going to respond and I'm going to take on board my part of the picture that you've drawn me into. And so we find in this time of Nehemiah that we see the Lord actually got this, not, it's not just Nehemiah, this amazing leader that makes it all happen. There are things, there, there are things God is putting in place, place and people that he's raising up to actually just keep the whole thing, the whole project, as it were, moving towards the purpose that he has determined. He will have a people. He will have a people that are called by his name. He will have a people that are defined in their nature. I'll come back to some of that in a minute. But the wonderful way in which he does that, and it is, it is an awesome thing to see, and it's something that you and I can consciously look out for. For example, Nehemiah is the man we're focused on, an amazingly gifted leader, very conscious of his relationship with God and the Spirit of God working within him. But we also find in this season the prophetic voice. A number of prophetic identities emerge in this time that we've traveled through thinking, well, it's only been eight weeks. And we can also get all excited about it. It was only 52 days that it took to restore the walls. But the whole thing of actually restoring the nation to where God wanted it to be took 80 years. Does that inspire you? Well, I'm probably thinking I'll be 150 when the Lord's finished whatever he's doing in this day. But we sometimes have that perception that it really is quite simple. All they need to do, meaning other people, is step into the place that I know it's right, according to my discernment, which is a long way short of the God's grand design. And so we have people like Zechariah, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, all those names that many of you have heard. They sit in the context of this restoration, this, this grand design program, in this portion of history that sits itself in the whole flow of eternity. But it is Nehemiah that has inspired us. And certainly the whole project happening in 52 days. Ah, how inspiring that is. To see a project up and about and finished in 52 days. I remember the occasion having come out of the building trade and uh, Margie and I were in Warnable at the time and we thought, well, it's really time that we started to think about our own house. We've been living in the church's manses for many years and uh, the greater percentage of people in full-time ministry were encouraged to uh, build their own homes. So I took my first lot of long service leave, uh, which was due when we were in Warrnambool. And in the space of 16 weeks, we built our first home. As in, Margie and I did it all. Not. Ah. Uh, Margie did supply some really neat morning teas and lunches and all that sort of stuff, but it was a shared project. It was actually a wonderful thing to be a part of because we had people from the other Christian fellowships, one fella said, I'll sign off on your building project because he was a licensed builder. I wasn't. I could still do own a builder. We had a, a design draftsman who said, I'll draw up the building, the, the designs for you and I'll get it through council for you. And we had one gentleman come along when it came to plastering. He says, I'll do it for you. I supplied the materials and, and away we went. And so and there's a sense in which I think, well, that's a little bit like Nehemiah. We didn't have church meetings in our home after that as such. We had home group and that type of thing. But it's, it's one of those things when you sort of see in the life journey, little bits come together and you realise uh, God's in it. But we had Nehemiah, uh, again, uh, the distinct leadership qualities that he brings into the picture were there for a time and a season. And he was that God-appointed catalyst to get this part of the project well and truly signed off on. And then we had uh, the person of ne um, Ezra, who had the teaching side of the ministry. 
the explanation and the understanding of the covenant relationship and how it works for people. And he stepped forward at a time when the hearts of the people were saying, we want to understand. We know we've missed the mark with God, but we want to understand how this covenant actually works. And so his ministry went, travelled in that direction. And it was quite... Uh, again, an inspiring thing. You can remember possibly the fact, uh, the most consistent feature we hear about Ezra is that he was the bloke who led the worship service that went for six hours. And if you can lead a worship service, I mean, Elaine's probably pretty okay with that, wouldn't you, Elaine? Yeah, you could go for six hours, could you? No, no trouble at all. Just keep the songs rolling up there and all this sort of stuff. But he was teaching the whole time. No, he wasn't teaching the whole time. They had groups from time to time. They had what I'd call breakout groups during that six hours. So as people had an opportunity to sort of give some feedback, hey, yeah, we're understanding that. We're traveling with you. Let's go. Let's have the, let's have the next bit. And so there was this uh, uh, interaction. There was this engaging in the process of uh, teaching and learning together. So they, they were um, three characters, three individuals that feature in the narrative of Nehemiah in the sense of the leadership, the particular um, giftings that they brought into the picture. And as I mentioned before, one of my aims has been to um, um, engage this word of God and then in some way bring it into the context of the 21st century church, which is who we are. We're a part of it. We're part of the picture, we're part of the, the, the grand design project that God's got going for right now. Because I'm not living in the time of Nehemiah, but I am living in a time that in many ways reflects, uh, presents similar uh, factors, similar features. For example, there are strong parallels. The major portions of the church in our day are sitting under foreign influences. There is a lot of fragmentation in the life of the Christian community. I would, I would venture to say that many Jesus followers are readily intimidated. And I would also venture to say that motivation to be the people of God may be considered low. Now, I make those comments in order to stir you up. And you can say to me afterwards, I don't agree with you, Peter. And I'll say to you, will you show me evidence that that's not true? Because the church in our nation is a restoration project. And it is the Lord's design. His grand design. To restore it. Not to the structure that we might be familiar with, not to the format, but to the dynamic that was at the very centre of Nehemiah's ministry. Reading Nehemiah, you could draw the, um, the picture that it was a three-stage project. Number one stage related to restoring the temple. Now that was a structure, that was a building, that was stones, that was features, that was archways and all the things that you'd see in the structure. It was a tangible thing. But at, at the very core of that tangible thing was a heart relationship with God. That's what the temple was about. It wasn't about a glorious structure it was about this is a place of reference where people would go and say, this is the place where my heart connects with God. Now you and I know that the number one project that God has going is that each and every individual experiences a heart reconnect with God. Is that why Jesus came? To build some structure? To build some institution? To build some layout of, of programs and great human ideas? Well, that could flow out of the heart. But the critical thing all the way through the scriptures is the Lord says, I want the, I want the connect with the heart. And that was where Nehemiah was traveling. 
in regards to his follow-up. He was actually following up Zerubbabel, who's, who's, he was stage one man to restore that temple so that people, that their very heart understood, I'm in a relationship with God. It's awesome. And then came Nehemiah. His plan was to restore the walls. And I would suggest to you the possible ways in which we could draw the parallel into our context of the 21st century, because I don't plan to be building any rock walls. I can't see any rock walls around. But I do know that those rock walls in Jerusalem, in the time of Jerusalem, gave definition. It gave boundaries to the identity of God's people. And it's like you and I, for example. We can ask ourselves this critical question. As a Jesus follower, how clearly defined is my identity? Can you see where I've made a bit of a jump there? Hopefully you can. What's, uh, if, if I talk about being a part of a church, where's the definition of my identity? And what does it look like to actually be in that definition of being a part of the body of Christ? Hopefully you can connect to some of those ideas because, as I said, I endeavour to take what is happening in this, in this context of Nehemiah and bring it into the 21st century. What is it to be a Jesus follower? If I own the name Christian, what does that give, in what ways do I, is that def defined? Is it, is it just a tenants at a gathering or is there something far deeper than that? And then the third stage is where Ezra has this, this wonderful responsibility. I, I'm going to make the parallel. I'm going to make the connection in the Old Testament with Ezra presenting the testimony of the scrolls and the law of Moses to what Paul talks about in the New Testament of you and I knowing the law of the Spirit. Which does exactly the same thing. The Spirit of God, often described as the encourager, is also often described as the teacher. He's the one that leads me into the truth. The truth of the identity of Jesus and then the truth of the, how that identity in Jesus then translates out to definition of identity of who I am. The most common term that Paul uses in his writings to many letters in the, in the New Testament context is in Christ. The most common term he uses, in Christ. The definition of his identity is in Christ, which is in itself. I can say, what a neat little phrase, I wonder what it means. Well, there's the venture of our Christian faith that, that we actually keep discovering, as it were, what it means to be a person in a faith relationship with Jesus. And my identity is now fixed in who he is. How does that work? What does it look like? Where do I go with that? What about these other strange people that make the same claim to be a Christian? Where does that take us? Well, there you go. I've asked a couple of questions, but the two that I asked last Sunday morning were, so what have we seen? What have we found in our shared venture through Nehemiah? And I think from day one, I've encouraged you to engage the word, read through it. And people have said they've read it through three and four times. Well done. What did you find? What, 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 what was it that was, was quickened to you in your journey through that script? that is alive, it's got an edge to it, it's going to speak to you, the Spirit of God's going to be doing something about your identity and your part in a community of faith, because that's what this script is about. It's Old Testament, but just, just as relevant as any portion of the New Testament. I got some feedback. Yes! Okay. Now you can guess... This is a little exercise you can do with an element of trust within the Christian community where we know each other to some extent. Got this insightful passage. Oh, can you read that? Some of you can, but I can't. But the good thing is I've got it on my script here. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. 
You are the Lord, you alone. You have made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them and the host of heaven worship you. We didn't actually look at that passage, but somebody did. Thanks, Jeffrey. You'd guessed already, hadn't you? Yes. Thanks, Jeffrey. But it is, you, you go through... Uh, you go through scriptures and you'll find these things that suddenly take you from that which is the earthly and the tangible and the nuts and bolts and doing the journey on the earthly and this concept or this, this reality of that which is beyond our current experience. And so as much as our hearts are orientated in that direction, at some stage they get earthed. And so what happened in the next submission that I received which was a personal vision um, of, of this script of Nehemiah that provides a place where an individual can, can realise that this no matter how damaged, distanced, diminished a life situation might be God in his grace can restore. Do you like that? Thanks James. powerful isn't it it's the earthing aspect of that which is the heavens so to speak and then a third one that was presented I brought back my New Testament glasses for this occasion so this one was a, a deepening appreciation of the person of Nehemiah once seen as simply the one who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem but now seen as a man of prayer carrying zeal for God's house and God's people. A man who loved God lots and his love translated to pleasing and serving the God he loved. Thanks, Pauline. We engage the word. And one of the reasons why I encourage people to give that sort of feedback is, I know that you own what you have just said. And you work with it. Whereas if you, um, and, and I'll put it as gently as I possibly can, everything Peter says, you can take it or leave it. But if you say something, you've owned it. Does that make, diff make a difference? That's why I encourage you, as it were, to engage this word and give feedback. Because it means you are actually engaging the word. You're not just listening to the bloke on Sunday spruiking something that you can take or leave. And I would suggest be careful what you take and be careful what you leave. Because in the grace of God, there is accountability. What you have heard Sounds heavy, doesn't it? Okay, here's my sprint to the finishing line. And these are the ones that are actually for those who've got a copy. If you'd like a copy of these visuals that I've used this morning, simply for this reason. This is some of the findings that I've used, some of the things that I've actually drawn, as it were, or they've spoken into my life over this last couple of months. Number one, the Lord will always have a people, holy and set apart. He will always have a people holy and set apart. The Lord will continue to build his church. That's the 21st century update. And that church, just like that previous slide indicated, will be holy, clearly defined, stand out, influential, doing everything, everything that the Lord has planned for his people. The major restoration project will often incorporate, will in fact always incorporate, the heart, the identity, and the thinking, the mind. That restoration project will always include those ingredients. The Lord does shape leadership 
for a season. Leadership to facilitate his great grand designs. That leadership can take all variety of shapes just like the prophetic ministries of those in the time of Nehemiah for Zerubbabel, for Nehemiah, for Ezra, for those people in that leadership situation in that community. Many of them we have discovered their names are actually there in the book, in print. Totally relevant for those reading that uh, record many, many centuries back, but not so relevant for us. But the Lord will always be raising up, shaping leadership to facilitate his restoration project. Ways will be opened up according to his plan and its timeline. Somebody made the comment to me even this morning and I said there was a timeline, 12 o'clock on Thursday, I would close off submissions. But somebody thought that they would bring one to me at 5 to 10 this morning. And, and they said to me, you know, the miracle of Nehemiah was actually King Artaxerxes. Of how this king said, go for it, what do you need? Oh yeah, I've got those forests there. You can use all that timber if you like. I'll send a, a note to all the governors around so they don't give you a hard time, even though they did. But you see, that's, that's the Lord. Perfect timing, always perfect timing. As it was in the time of Jesus, at just the right time. People, people still say to me, why didn't Jesus come in the 21st century so as he could get on YouTube? Hmm? good reason there's a lot of rubbish on YouTube and he might get mixed up in it but the point being at just the right time perfectly timed and that's one of the things that you and I in many ways the personal journey is I want my steps perfectly in time with his schedule the next aspect that I shared with you The realistic picture of the dimensions of the project, and that's where our reading came from this morning. I don't know if you're tracking with, uh, with Louise as she read it, but that was, again, Nehemiah saying, this is the reality of the picture. I haven't got my head in the heavens and I haven't got my head in the sand. I can see the reality of the project. And so he was prepared and could actually, as it were, under the counsel of the Spirit, just set out the steps and things that would be required to complete the project. People rally as the Spirit of God moves them. They are drawn into uh, the picture. They are drawn into what it was that Nehemiah is portraying for them as literally the vision for the walls. And they are drawn in and say, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll be in that. And they, great chorus, let us join in this great project. Momentum is a great thing. Momentum is a really good thing, but it will need to be maintained. And that was one of the ventures that Nehemiah was working with all the time. Momentum. And it's something in the life of the Christian community. We can get to a certain point and we sort of think, Jason Recliner, big screen TV, retirement, and it's not on. The momentum, as it were, of, of God's grand design is something to be maintained. And that's, uh, again, part of that's a personal journey and, uh, and a shared one as well. Prompts to persist will be appropriate. One of the most common sort of um, messages that you read, in, in my opinion, in devotional books will take on one of these notes. Fear not, remember, fight on, work it out. Devotionals are often around, not always, but my reading, often around those little nudge, nudge, you know, that there is just, just always be aware. Remember, the Lord is always with you. Right. People can say that's a cliche. Well, let me tell you, the Bible's full of cliches. And we're saying, oh, don't bother about cliches. You know, fear not. How many times does it appear in the scriptures? 366. That's one for every day of the year and a spare one. But the point being, sometimes people challenge us about these things and I'm thinking, what are you suggesting? That I ignore these prompts? when they are so valid, 
when these are the issues that I'm often dealing with as an individual? They're there for a purpose. They've just got those little, they've just got the little point to them. And, uh, and they always have a God purpose. And celebrating is always uh, uh, an appropriate thing. It's something that happened for Nehemiah. There was a great celebration. And there, when that, that part of the project, stage two, was completed, there was clearly uh, a great sense of achievement. We're, we're heading in the right direction. We've covered that space. It, there's, 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 I can see visibly, tangibly, there is evidence of that part of the, the project is complete. And we can celebrate. The timely prophetic voice will also echo out. Just remember, this is the Lord's work, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. And then Ezra's, um, Ezra's ministry. And I have to say, of the three stages that are portrayed in this uh, book of the Bible, Nehemiah, stage one was incomplete. Stage three was quickly traded in. And you sort of think, doesn't God complete things? Of course he does. But the point is, the labourers, the labourers seem to think, well, I probably don't need to listen out for what the Spirit of God's saying. Mm, double check that one. And the final bit that we looked at last Sunday was that we are alert to uh, the trends. The trends that actually prevail around our shared journey. The trends that sort of we don't necessarily entertain. So I conclude this series and this morning with this particular psalm. Some of you may recognise it as you look to the walls of our chapel. Show me your ways. Psalm 25, 4. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. In many ways, a concentrated capsule of Nehemiah. The project we're in. Nehemiah is distant. God's grand design is right in our lap. It is right before us. All the things he did in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra and the prophets, same project going. And that's that readiness for us as a people who are prepared to acknowledge the Spirit of God is moving. Responsive hearts he is looking for. People who would be prepared, as it were, to quite literally pick up the portion that he imparts to us and do it well as unto him. Please stand as I pray and then we'll sing our final song. Father, again, we do acknowledge that we are a part of your grand design. Lord Jesus, we are a part of your church. And we can find great comfort by knowing that your church is advancing in South America and Central Asia. And, but Lord, we want to see your church advancing in the South Coast. We want to see your grand design being implemented in the very context of our personal heart store. That we would have, as it were, by the gracious stirring of your spirit within us, that measure of enthusiasm, that measure of motivation, that measure of anticipation that you will work by your spirit in our hearts, in our lives, in our identities, in, 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 in everything that we, as it were, present to you to, as it were, be an instrument for the purpose, Lord Jesus, of building your church. To your glory, Father, lead us by your spirit into the future you have prepared for us in Jesus' name. Amen.